Okay. So welcome everyone to uh, supported African American students in the community college. Uh, my name is Hiro McMeekin. My pronouns are we, he, him, and his. Um, and I'm uh, the director of equity and pathways for the North Carolina Community College, uh, North Carolina Community College Student Success Center. I apologize. Um, and so we appreciate you being here today. We have something very, very important to talk about. Uh, and what I would like to do is uh, allow Ms. Ali to, if she wants to say anything, and then I'll jump back and read uh, our speaker's bio. Yes, yeah, just want, want to say good morning to everyone and welcome you all as well um, to this uh, webinar. Looking forward to the content. And I agree with Hiro in reference to we have some very important information coming forward and looking forward to hearing um, how we can support African American students on our community college campuses. So thank you, Hiro. Yeah, no problem. So uh, we have Brittany Pivot here today, and she's originally from Fayetteville, uh, but grew up in the Charlotte area. Um, she attended East Carolina University, and she where she discovered her passion for helping students achieve their post high school goals. After working in undergraduate admissions for eight years at two UNC system schools, uh, she transitioned into her dream job now at CFNC. Uh, now she gets to help students, families, and adult learners plan, apply, and pay for college and a career through all of the amazing resources CFNC uh, provides. And with that being said, I turn it over to Ms. Brittany. Thank you so much. And it's so refreshing to see how many people are on the call this morning. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and listen to us talk about ways that we can support students, specifically our African. American students at the community college level. As we all know, community colleges really directly impact the local economies. And um, today I really wanna to touch on how do we support our African American students when it comes to major selection so that they can play a viable role in their local economies and make an impact on those economies that they directly are impacted by. So we have an awesome panel today. And I wanted to, um, when we are, doing these presentations, I, I really think it's important that we recognize and continue to um, make sure that we have representation from all across the state because North Carolina is not monolithic. It is a very diverse state economically and racially. And I want to make sure that we have people who are represented from all different parts of the state. So we have people from the east where I live down here in Wilmington all the way to western North Carolina on the call today to talk about how we support our African American students um, when it comes to the high school level all the way through their community college experience. Now, the reason that I chose this particular topic is not only because the community colleges do impact the local economies, um, but through research, studies have shown that African American students typically um, tend to pursue lower paying majors. And I wanted to talk about how we can impact and talk to African American students as a whole student um, with being African American as a small part of their experience as a human um, to help them get a better understanding of what's going to be the best path for them. Um, our jobs as educators and working in um, the community college level is to really help make sure that students are making the best informed decision about their future. So we have an awesome lineup today and I'm going to have them introduce themselves and say what role they play um, when it comes to working with students and then we will roll into um, this panel discussion. I do have a few canned questions that I will ask the panel to kind of get the conversation started and then we will turn it over to you all in the chat and see how we can share our expertise with you on how we've supported students in the past and really make this a discussion. Um, so that people can have their voices heard and learn from each other um, as we progress through the presentation today. So I'm going to go based off of who I can see on my screen. And it looks like the first person I have over here is Dontario Perkins from, uh, from Cape Fear Community College. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Ms. Trigger stated, I'm Dontario Perkins. First of all, let me, let me back up. I want to say that I'm uh, truly, truly grateful and appreciative for this opportunity to uh, speak with everyone. Um, I'm honored and I'm definitely humbled um, to be here this morning. Um, but I am, again, I'm Dontario Perkins. I am today a diversity success coordinator here at Cambridge Community College. Um, here in our diversity center, they are integrated some facilities to um, increase the minority retention. Um, Dontario, I, I apologize for interrupting. It's it's kind of hard to hear you. It's good, like going in and out. I don't know if that's just, is that just me? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it may just be a little, I don't know if you can turn your volume up just a little bit. Yeah. 
I, I have a, a weird camera over here. Can you guys hear me better now? All right. You screwed up a little bit. Let's see. All right. Better? All right. Sorry about that. So, yeah, um, again, I'm Dr. Harry Perkins and uh, with the uh, Baker Community College um, Nixon Leader Center for uh, Diversity and Success um, here in Wilmington, North Carolina. So, I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Don Terrio. All right, up next we have Neil Van Dyke representing the Western side of the state and also representing the high school side of things. Hey, you guys, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so I work with the uh, Robert and Janice McNair Educational Foundation. So we are a nonprofit organization that is uh, assimilated into our local school system here in Rutherford County, North Carolina. Um, we work in a variety of different roles. Uh, we are a small foundation that looks to make a large impact on the community that we serve. Um, and we work with our students from elementary through middle school, through high school, and on through college completion. Um, specifically, my role is in the college completion um, and in that transition from the end of high school into uh, college and success in the, at the co collegiate level. Um, again, I would like to say, uh, reiterate too, that I am... Uh, Really excited to be here on this panel. Um, privileged to, to be asked to be here and to um, help further the cause and, and, and further the, the benefits of our students being successful at the post-secondary level. Thank you so much, Neil. I'm so happy to have you here and happy to have the Western side of the state represented. All right, coming from smack dab in the middle of the state, we have Ms. Nzinga Williams from Cape, or not, I'm so sorry, from Central Piedmont Community College. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me good? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I thought we were past that question, you know, but <laughs> we got it. We got to ask. So, good morning, everybody. My name is Nzinga Williams. Um, I serve as a career and technical education coordinator here at Central Piedmont Community College, and I also coordinated our Perkins grant. Um, I am super excited to be here. This is my passion. I love everything um, about the community college and about the students that we serve. So, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Of course, of course. I'm super excited to have such a diverse panel this morning. Um, and I've worked with m uh, two of you in different capacities. And Nzinga, um, you're a little bit further out of my territory, but um, I'm excited to have all of you representing um, your institutions today and to have this fruitful discussion about how we can support students. Um, so I think the first thing I want to kind of get out of the way is learning a little bit about you all and your backgrounds um, so that we can talk about where you're coming from when it comes to supporting students. Um, so I guess my first question is going to be, what was your major in college and what, what led you to choose that specific major? If you could go back, would you choose the same major? That's the follow-up question on that. So I'm going to start um, with Nzinga. Okay, so um, I went to the great uh, North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I am a Wolfpack, go Wolfpack to all the Wolfpacks in the room. Um, and I majored in criminology and psychology. So I am from a really small town, rural town um, in Virginia, Lawrenceville, Virginia. Many people don't know about Lawrenceville. It's a one stop light town. Um, typically who you graduate or who you go to elementary school with are your friends all the way through middle school and high school. So it was a really, really small town. Um, and so what really chose me to choose psychology and criminology honestly was money, right? So um, if you can imagine rural town, um, most people, the poverty level is very, very low, raised by a single mom. And so I wanted to be a lawyer. That's exactly, that's what I thought I was going to do. I was going to graduate NC State and go to law school, major in, in, in you know, do some type of corporate law um, to, to really have a great income. Um, if I could go back, I would definitely choose a different major. Knowing what I know now about the workforce and just all the exposure that I had in college and then after college, I would definitely choose a different major. Awesome. Do you know what that major would be if you chose a different major? Um, no. So I, I told a friend, I was like, you know what, growing up, we, we, we weren't introduced to a lot of the different industries, right? So um, one of the ones that I found lately is welding. Like welders make a lot of money. And so my friend was like, you wouldn't have been a welder. And I'm like, I don't know, because I wasn't introduced to that. Um, and so I think I just would have, have liked the option of having choices. I only saw doctor, lawyer, educator, 
Um, and I, I am in education. I think that's a calling. That's what I'm called to do. Um, but I could have went about it a different way, right? Um, to save money, to save time and all those things. So. And I think what you said is super important that coming from a small town, which a lot of our North Carolina students do, they aren't exposed to different opportunities and different majors. Their world isn't very big yet. And as we work in education, we know those opportunities. And I think it's our job to really expose students to what the possibilities are. Um, usually when I'm in classrooms, I like to tell students to look at the ceiling, look at the floor, and somebody was in charge of making each and every tile and laying those tiles. There's a job for everything out there. So I think that's fantastic that you shared your story in that way because you are not the only one and you are just like a lot of the students we work with. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Dontario, do you wanna talk a little bit about um, your path? Because I think it's pretty similar to Nzingo when it comes to the field that you chose. Yeah, so um, this week, you, you and I, we pretty much have a similar story. Um, I am also from a very small town. I saw some uh, Pitt Community College uh, names pop up here. So I grew up in a small town of Bethel, uh, which is about 10 miles north of Greenville, uh, went to North Pitt High School, which um, similar to Ms. Williams, all my friends from kindergarten are the same ones that I graduated high school with. Um, I went to North Carolina Wesleyan College in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, and I chose to major in our criminal justice. And one of the things that, um, that actually led me to uh, choosing my majors. Being, being from a small town, there wasn't a lot of opportunities for, for, for you know, black students. Um, my hometown was literally separated by a railroad track, which is on one side was pretty much where I lived. And on the other side was more of the, in a small town, which you consider like prominent neighborhood, people who really had money, you know, their parents had life insurance. You know, I didn't really know what life insurance was until like I got older for real, you know? Um, so not really having like, all those opportunities then, the small town that we were in, you know, we, we did have a police department. It was probably like maybe 10 officers, but they, it was, it was an, an, an intention to anything we were doing, whether we were playing basketball, we were playing football, like an open field, which definitely was a rural, rural town. Um, they found all ways of using like messing with like constantly. And I grew up not liking law enforcement. A lot of, you know, kids like me, you know, you don't really deal with police, you don't really like interact with them. So I went into to that field to, I guess to be what I wanted to see in a law enforcement officer when I was growing up. I wanted to like be that change. I wanted to um, actually have an opportunity to, you know what, I, I want to be someone who they can look up to. So, you know what, all officers are, are not bad. You know, everyone that has a bad feeling is not out here to hurt, they're not out here to harm. So going into that, I just knew when I chose my major, I was going to have this big time federal job. No one really told me about you know, like working my way up until I started my uh, internship with Rocky Mountain Police Department um, my junior year. And I realized that, okay, you know what? This goal that I have, it's a long shot. And it's, it's, it's almost like, to me, I put it as the equivalent to someone who's a kid who has this NBA dream and wants to go off and play basketball. Like for, for our students, like me, me in particular, I found out that it's kind of the same thing. Like, yeah, I had this dream of being a U.S. Marshal. Like, no matter what it is I want to do, but every time like I, I chose to, but it was like my police department, Brentwood PD, there was something that always happened. So my career in criminal justice started out as a probation officer. And, you know, I ended up doing that and working in my drug treatment club program, which I love. I did that for about seven years. So can you guys hear me better now? I think I'm going to end up holding the camera. <laughs> um, so yes, I ended up doing that for about seven years and I absolutely enjoyed it, absolutely loved it. It had me the opportunity to not only speak to students from a um, criminal justice standpoint, actually helping them with the um, questions about law and things like that to navigate through the actual court system, but also give me an opportunity to let them know, hey, there are educational processes out, out here, educational opportunities for you to be successful. Don't just be stuck at, you know, working at Bojack. You can do something other than, you know, going to punch in at a fast food restaurant. So a lot of times I refer them to the case because I even thought that I would even come over here and get a job. I would bring them over here, sit down and talk to people they can actually um, see with our economic and workforce development program. But hey, there's something else you can do from nine to five that's gonna pay you three times as much as what you're making over at this fast food restaurant. So um, if I could go back, um, similar to what Ms. Williams said, I don't think that I would have chose criminal justice all because you know I was really hoping that I could uh, make a lot of money coming out of school. A wedding was a private college, so I'm still paying them back now. Um, so, you know, I, I had this had this dream at one point of being a barber. So I definitely think I would have went to barber school. 
and I wouldn't have had all that debt. So, yeah. Thank you so much. I think um, what I'm hearing in your your um, answer is that we could do a lot better on ed educating students on the path that it takes to get them to where they want to go um, and not discouraging them, but letting them know that it does take moving up in the world to get to where you want to go um, and empowering them with that and helping them learn different lessons at each level to get to where they want to end up. And I love that you and Ms. Williams also mentioned that you would go back and choose majors that are available at our community colleges. <laughs> Um, and it's a great way to save uh, money, but it's also a great way yet again to do something hands-on and welding and um, working in a, a barbershop area or that area of study are both very viable opportunities in communities. Those are both things that you can do to directly impact your local communities. So I think that's fantastic. Um, Neil, I'd love to hear your story. Um. Well, so I am, like I stated before, I'm from Rutherford County, uh, North Carolina. I'm from a small town, just like our other two uh, people on the panel. Um, I grew up in a, in, a, in a small community that had a caution light, um, and we were 30 minutes from the, from the uh, smallest local town. Um, much like uh, our other representatives, you know, I, who you went to elementary school with is who you graduated high school with. Um, I, for a long time, I am a first generation college student. Uh, and, and for a long time, um, I was ashamed to share the story um, just of, of my college experience uh, because I bounced around a little bit. I didn't know what I was looking for. I set things up in a logical way that I thought was going to make me successful as a college freshman. Clearly, that was not the case. Made a lot of rookie mistakes that put me in some really weird places. Um, so I bounced from um, from uh, UNC Asheville to uh, got an associate's degree from Central Piedmont Community College um, and uh, then, then transferred into Western Carolina University, uh, got a degree in recreational therapy there with the dreams and ideas of going on to be a physical therapist. Um, I realized as I was doing that, no, that's not what I want to do at all. Um, and, and I will say a, a humbling experience. I worked on a psych ward for a little bit after graduation, but um, not too long after graduation, um, you know, bills need to be paid, things have to be done, and it is a humbling experience for a uh, person with a bachelor's degree, and you're coming off of that high to be flagging traffic on Main Street in your hometown because bills got to be paid and things have to be done. Um, and so um, a lot of the conversations that I have with my students is don't be afraid to work, and where you start is not where you finish at. Um, you know, carry yourself with pride and integrity. Um, and, and look for ways that you can produce better outcomes for yourself. Um, I, I, I have a master's degree in school counseling from Gardner-Webb University. Um, I think I, I met the right people along the way and I had good mentors. And I will say, I use the phrase a lot, I fell forward into the right space. Um, and, and not to any, any um, master plan of my own, I was just asking the right questions and I just kept asking the right questions to people who I thought might could give me the right answers. Um, and, and I think that I was always, hindsight is always 20-20, um, but I was always circling a helping profession. I was always looking to help someone else. Um, so as a school counselor, um, as, a, um, as an academic advisor counselor, uh, for the um, foundation that I work with now was always where I was going to be because I was always going to be looking to help those people. Um, I do think that if I had had um, seen opportunities um, earlier on, I think I would have chosen a different uh, career path. Um, I think I probably would have chosen something um, that I would have gotten out and maybe made a little more money hands on. Um, I don't know that I would have been as fulfilled though, just to be real honest. I, I think. Um, the journey that I took was a was a winding road. Had a lot of potholes. Um, had a lot of had a lot of ditches that I was trying to steer and and, and stay out of. Um, but I, I think it, it it brought me to a place where I could relate that to my students and try to identify with them as they're trying to be successful too. Awesome, circling back to that path and letting students know that it, it's not. Uh, you just graduate and become a doctor or you just graduate and start making 70 grand right out of college. I think a lot of students need to understand that it takes a while to get there, but it 
the journey is really what makes it so exciting and makes it um, so much more rich once you get to that that finished line or that goal, that dream job that you want to go into. Um, and I think all of you do a great job when it comes to supporting students in that role. I will say I majored in sociology and I was concentrated in social diversity. And I was definitely one of those students that lucked up and found my kind of like my niche really early, um, but I started college. I went to East Carolina University. It is game day. I, I am wearing purple lipstick for a reason. Um, <laughs> trying to do my subtle plug for my alma mater today. Um, yes, go Pirates all day. I have some of my classmates, former classmates on the call right now um, who are in higher ed now. Um, but I would definitely say I started as a marriage and family therapy um, major and I took a parenting class and quickly called my mom and apologized for everything I had ever done. Um, I knew there was no longer a marriage and family therapy. Counseling was not going to be in my uh, wheelhouse, but I learned really quickly that I love people and I love studying people. I think we are really fascinating creatures, um, but I also learned that community is extremely important and that we can learn so much from each other's stories. And that's one of the reasons why I love doing panel discussions um, rather than presentations, because each of our stories are so different, but we all are really working towards the same goal. And that's helping students achieve their goals through our advising, through our, our conversations, every interaction that we have with students can make an impact um, just by sharing who you are. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is like, you shining your light gives people permission to shine their own light. So I really um, appreciate you all sharing your stories. Um, to keep the conversation going, I just want to know, based on the capacity within which you work with students and feel free to share how you kind of interact with students, um, how do you advise students on major selection and kind of ironing out that path? If we're gonna stay with that kind of path theme, how do you talk to students and, and really encourage them on their path and help them tweak their path to make it gonna make it be the best path possible? I'm gonna start with Neil um, because I come from admissions and I've worked with the McNair Foundation in the past and I think they do a phenomenal job of working with the whole student within the community um, and really helping them get a better understanding of how they can play a role in their community. Um, so if you wanna talk a little bit about how you all do that and the conversations that you have, um, before I get to, uh, you would get to that, I wanna say Rutherford County is really a very diverse county in Western North Carolina. Um, so I've seen them work with students um, in different capacities, but also students from very diverse racial and economic backgrounds to help them achieve their goals. So I'm gonna turn it over to Neil to talk a little bit about how he does that. Awesome. So um, I will try to uh, give you guys a, uh, I don't say quick and dirty, but I, I'll try to, I'll try to be direct with, with uh, what we do and how we do it. Um, it's a, it's a really awesome opportunity and, and we're unique in the fact that we have no strings attached to us uh, as far as we have a board that, that governs what we do, um, but we are independent of, of a lot of different um, entities that would, that, would, that would limit our funds and the usage of our funds. Um, so when we start working with our students in the community, um, we start early uh, in middle school and we start in that eighth grade year at doing a connect tour. And so if we talked about opportunities and that's one of the things that, that I heard everybody on the panel say was thinking about opportunities and, and um, allowing us to have opportunities to make choices um, as a counselor, my job and my thought always and the first conversations I have with my students, especially in high school is, okay, let's look at the big picture. Let's see all of our opportunities because I want you as a senior, if you want to choose to do something that's you're in and you're out and you know what you wanna to do to get out and make the most money possible and have a successful career, yes, let's get you there. That's the goal, that's the plan. Um, but I want you to have the choice to make multiple different opportunities happen. Um, so not to be pigeonholed into one space. So what do we got to do to get you to a place where you have multiple options? Um, so one of the ways that we start that is with the Connect Tour. And obviously during um, COVID and quarantine uh, or COVID times, um, things have changed for us significantly and, and we're hoping to rebound into some positive uh, areas. But um, it's a program that we've had going on for, for multiple years now. But we take our students from the middle school out into the local community, they tour businesses. Um, we, we send all of our middle schools out. We rotate them on um, 
in, into multiple businesses. They talk about what the education looks like to get that job, um, what, the, what it looks like um, to be in that office. Um, they meet those people, they're, they're at that location. Um, and then um, we provide lunch for them and then they come back in and we have, we have talks about that in the afternoon um, with them. That piece starts to kick off what we look at when we're looking at career exploration and how we want to push our students into um, being successful or finding their niche or finding their, their dream job. Um, we're, we're about to launch uh, a second piece of that as a reconnect tour as a 10th grader, because you guys know as seventh and eighth graders, you know, you're, you, you have an idea, but you're really just on the tip of the iceberg. So as a sophomore in high school, you've had a little more experience. And now we're looking to try to dig a little deeper into those same avenues and getting those students out into the community, seeing those people, identifying with those people in their community, putting in a name with a face and expanding their circle uh, of, of influence uh, for them. Um, the, uh, the other piece that we do with that, um, it's just a one small piece of what we do, but um, the other piece with that is as they get into those last years of, of high school, we offer a conference style um, event where it's called the College and Career 101 Conference. Um, and so we have speakers that come in. Um, Brittany has, has came and helped us out with that from time to time. Um, we, we attack different areas of what's about to happen to them after they graduate high school. Um, for as far as uh, even going so far as planning a college schedule. What do your potholes look like in your college schedule? How do you read that college schedule? Can you plan your own college schedule, right? And how do you look at that big picture? Uh, so we have different events that, that are things that go with that to financial aid. What do you look like when you're looking at your, what, is it, what does your financial aid package look like? Um, and then we, we cut the kids and divert them onto two paths. You have your four-year students who are um, looking to go to university. And so that track looks a little different. And then we host this event on our community college campus. And then we push our other kids who know that they're gonna either transfer from the community college or be involved in a program at that community college. They tour campus, they have the same type meetings, but with more of a community college focus so that they can be successful once they get there. Um, it's a really, really awesome day. It's, it's heavy for all of us because there's a lot of moving pieces um, and there's only 12 of us at our foundation. Um, so we bring in a lot of outside help um, and we have a lot of buy-in from the local community uh, schools. But the idea for us is to provide those opportunities, to provide those platforms, and then to give knowledge um, into what happens next. Um, specifically on top of that, what I do is I, I help with college completion. So after the students graduate high school, um, I look to try to keep them in college. Um, my elevator speech is typically, um, my job is to get you into college to keep you in college and get you out for the least amount of money so that you can make the most amount of money. Um, so trying to help them navigate that, um, whether that's your financial aid package and does a private college, does a, does a private school offer you enough financial aid? And what does that long-term debt looks like? And how, how do we break that down so that you understand what you're walking into or to a community college to say, okay, this is what we've got. These are the questions you need to ask your advisor. If the first person says no, how do I redirect that question and how do I get to the right person? Because you guys know just as well as I do, as a first generation college student, I took the first answer as no and turned around and walked out the door and it put me in some bad situations, right? So how do I readdress authority and ask the right question in a respectful manner that gets me where I need to be? Um, so uh, that's a lot, I get it. And, and I know that I'm speaking, when I get started, um, I'm speaking, 500 miles an hour. So Brittany, feel free to say, pump the brakes, Van Dyke, pump the brakes. Um, but but I'm, uh, I hope that that, uh, that kind of enlightens a little bit of, of what your question was and gets us started on the discussion. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, I'm so glad that you explained it because I think you guys do it in a way um, down in Rutherford County that really helps students see themselves in their own community. Um, I know a lot of people who want to stay home but don't see those opportunities at home and feel like they need to leave to find opportunities. And there are a lot of people who really could play a, an awesome role in what they do. Um, so I really appreciate that. 
And some of the things that I've seen the Nair Foundation do that I think are unique, um, which I think are really awesome, um, is that recently with COVID, they realized that a lot of their students weren't finding those connections on campus. They weren't able to really connect. So the McNair Foundation picked up and did a tour of the entire state and went to all of the colleges where their students were freshmen and allowed them space and time to talk to each other. Um, I know you said that you had students who lived in residence halls that were across the street from each other but hadn't talked since they started school because of COVID. Um, so you gave them that opportunity. Community is so important. It's the first word in community college um, and we definitely really want to push that when it comes to allowing students to understand that they play a role at their community colleges as a student and that they can connect with people like yourselves. Everybody on this call, like we said before, plays a role in creating that sense of community for students. Um, and helping them get to where they need to go. So the Rutherford, the Rutherford County McNair Foundation does a great job of starting that early and allowing them to be, feel empowered to be a part of their community wherever they go. Um, Neil, did you have something else to add? Yeah, I was just gonna add to that uh, on, on the last statement about us touring the schools. Sometimes it's it's it was really nice for our students to see a familiar face, to see somebody from home that maybe they hadn't seen and, and, and from a, from a community college perspective for a lot of our representatives uh, in the room, um, we see it from a, from a base level high school sending you to college. And then all of a sudden that ties cut. Um, and a lot of times they may not come ask you at the community college for help, but they'll come back to the people they know. And so we try to create that, that environment where you can come back and you can ask us anything and we'll try to redirect you to the right person to get the right help. Um, so that's the community co or the, the college tour, um, the reunion tour is what we called it. We had t-shirts made up the whole nine um, for the spring, but it was really great for the kids to see us, for us to see them and then for them to connect to each other. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, and just know that each of you on your community college campuses can be that person that they know. You know, you can make that connection. Um, we all know that one person that we went to in college, whether it was our advisor or a professor that we really liked or a boss, somebody that we trusted that we went and, and made sure that we connected with. So I really encourage you all to, to try to figure out as you're, you're going through your career and going through your day, how can I be that person for at least one student a semester so that they, they feel safe and they, they know um, that they can ask those questions. I'm gonna turn it over to Nsinga, um, since you work with students a lot one-on-one -on -one, um, to talk a little bit about how you advise students when it comes to major selection or at least ironing out their path. Yeah, so, um, you know, a lot of time, I spent a lot, pre-COVID, I spent a lot of time in our high schools, a lot of time in our high schools, really in classrooms that um, were specific to our career and technical education path or program of studies here at the community college, whether that was health science, engineering, you know, construction, graphic arts, graphic designs. And I spent a lot of time listening to students and really trying to understand where they wanna go. So um, it would be more or less, you know, Ms. Williams, I want to become a doctor. Okay, well, let's talk about that right? Why do you want to become a doctor? I want to help people. Awesome. So do you know where you want to go to med school? But wait a minute, I got to go to med school? Yeah, you have to go to med school. You realize becoming a doctor is going to take you a while. And, it, and if you want to do that, but I want you to understand how long it's going to take, right? You're not going to graduate undergrad and become a doctor. Um, and so a lot of my conversations with students, um, I walk a fine line because you don't want to kill their dreams. You don't want to say, you know, you want to remind them that the sky is the limit. You can do anything you want to do, um, it, but you have to be very strategic and be very intentional about how you do that. And so particularly here in Charlotte, um, a lot of our students are living at a socioeconomic level where they can't necessarily afford to go straight to college, the four-year institution, and so on. And so I introduce them to a different way to, to get to the end goal, right? So start with the end in mind. Absolutely. If doctor's the end goal, let's get you the doctor but allow the community college to be part of your journey. So if you wanna become a doctor, have you ever heard of EMT? No, I've never heard of that. Okay, well, as an EMT, you can start working at the age of 18, right? Because in our conversation, I heard that you're taking care of mom, you're taking care of dad, you're taking, so the idea of you being able to go to school full-time may not be realistic. So have you ever heard of being an EMT? No. Well, it's short-term training. You can start doing it right away. And many of our community college have 
transfer agreements, articulation agreements, where you can go to a four-year after you do that. And it benefits you um, because not only are you getting the experience, but you're getting the clinical hours that you're going to need for medical school. You're building your resume because now you have some experience that a student that went from high school to four year to med school didn't get because you have that practical experience. And so I really try to make it relatable to students and meet them where they are uh, because they their dreams are so big, so, so big. But let's think about realistically what you can do and what you can handle. Um, and then the other competing factor is social media, um, influencers, and really helping students figure out where that fits into their lives. We have a lot of students, um, especially here in our area, who are creative. We live in a very creative space. So Charlotte is very artsy, very eclectic. And so they want to figure out how they tap into that. And so I spend a lot of time saying, OK, um, here's how you can do that at the community college. Here's how this path does that. And really just explaining the entire entire pathway to students and making that connecting. I think exposure is key. Um, a lot of students don't know what else is out there. They don't know the different ways or the different routes to get to where they're trying to get to. I also think connecting the dots for them. And I think it was um, uh, Dontario who mentioned, you know, he would have chosen barber school. Well, explain to a student how becoming a barber can really ignite your passion, but you can also make a lot of money by choosing that pathway. And I think helping those students connect those dots for them really at the end of the day when I'm done talking to them or we're having a conversation, I'm getting to know them. And they're like, you know what? I really never thought of it like that. I didn't know I could be an entrepreneur and be a barber. Absolutely. You know, it, it looks very different now in the 21st century. And so I really try to get them excited about, you know, really what they want to do and, and how to do that in a in a very socioeconomic safe, realistic way to where they're not, they're not breaking, breaking the bank. Fantastic. I think we can say it until our face is blue that exposure is super important. A lot of our students don't know what they don't know. If you're from a town with one stoplight and that one convenience store that, you know, six people hang outside all day and then you've got a, the hospital isn't even close to your town. It's 45 minutes away. Um, you've got one clinic in town and then you've also got that one food line with the one Chinese food restaurant. We all know what small towns in North Carolina looks like, but we know, we know what opportunities are out there. And I feel like it's our job and we owe it to students to to help them understand the connection between EMT and going to med school yeah. and yeah and transferable skills are super important super important Empowering them to understand that if you want to do this you can start here and transfer those skills there so thank you mm -hmm. so much yeah, and I, if I can add one more thing to that, sure. I think one of the things that sometimes I know we have taken for granted in our larger metropolitan areas is that those students that are here know everything that they all, that offer in the city, right? So if they live in Charlotte or they live in Wake County, it's big. So they should know all the industries and all those things, but they're living in their own silos. Like I have students, you know, Charlotte is split up in wards. So I have students that have never left their area. They stay on West Side, West Side of Charlotte and they don't realize that on the South Side of Charlotte, you know, a Lowe's is popping up. They don't know that because their community, back to um, what Neil was saying, the people they know, the people they trust are on the West Side of Charlotte. So a lot of those conversations are like, hey, like let's, you know, teacher, can I bring your student out of the school, get them to go to our Levine campus that's on a different side of Charlotte so they can see what they don't know. And I think sometimes we take that for granted. So it's pulling them outside of their schools and getting them into the city as well. 100%, 100%. I used to work with students in Charlotte who had never been to Carowinds. Um, and there are people that travel all over the state to get to Carowinds. Um, so I think we, I, I love that you mentioned that because I think we think our, our rural students are the only ones that just don't know what's what's out there. But a lot of our urban students also have a lack of understanding of the community that surrounds them because we are a very siloed state in general. Um, and I think that's culturally what the country looks like right now. We're all in our silos. And so exposing people to um, opportunities within their greater community, not necessarily their immediate community, it can be really valuable. So thank you so much. Um, Dontario, do you want to talk a little bit about how you advise students um, in choosing their path and stuff like that? Yes, I'm going to ask again. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. So I have to call in. So okay, we're good to go. 
Um, so um, with me, one, one of the things that I, that I like to do um, when it comes down to um, helping students to choose their path, um, like everyone else has said, I, I, I try to be intentional about not being a dream killer. Um, I think back to the times where like I actually had a, a mentor um, who was a provost at the college at the time. And he just kind of like pulled me to the side and you know explained to me, you know, well the major that you're going in, like, I understand you want to help people. However, you may not make you know the amount of money that, that you want to make. So this was like my junior year, and he was just really like he was laying it on thick to the point where it was like it was kind of hurtful. So you know, like you're expecting to you know go into um, this federal agency. However, you got to have the experience. You know, you have to be willing to like, you know, like you said, Brittany, you got to be willing to work your way up. So um, just just here recently, you know, I had a student to come in. And he was talking about, you know, um, had this dream of, you know, wanting to be, um, he said he wanted to be, he said he, he wanted to go to, to be a doctor, but he didn't really understand, like, all the steps that there were to becoming a, becoming a doctor. Um, so the first thing I asked him, okay, well, how do you feel about, about blood? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really like, you know, gory stuff. I don't, I don't really... I don't really like that. I'm like, well, man, look, I don't know what kind of doctor you plan on being. You know, if you, if, you, if you can't deal with blood, like that's, you know, you might want to consider like doing something else just off the fact that that's probably part of the job, even even if it's not a surgery. Someone may come in with a laceration on their hand. Yeah, it may just need a Band-Aid, but guess what? You're going to see blood from that. Um, but just, just having having an opportunity to actually like talk with them to helping them understand, okay, well, um, and, and I've, also, I've also shown this, this student, I've shown them numbers. Um, the one one of the great one of the biggest things I tell them, okay, well the fact that you're here at Cape Fear, um, you know, you've already made like the first step to accomplishing your your goal. Um, but the next thing that I tell them is that um, a lot of those students who actually come here with these dreams of being in the medical profession, I'm not sure if it's a thing of or uh, high school counselor or or whatever the case, but there's a separate admissions process here at Cape Fear for um, the medical programs, and a lot of them don't don't know that. Um, so when I actually have this conversation with them, you know, it's not to necessarily um, to be stepping or like, you know, killing their dreams. But hey, look, you know, you can't have a D in biology and expect to get into this this med school program, or to even get into the med school program here at Cape Fear in order for you to transfer into a four-year school. So being able to sit down with them, okay, look, this is what it's going to take. You know, I understand. You know, you don't want to sign up for a tutor, but guess what? You having a D in this class is not going to get you to where you need to go. And I think, like, once we start having, like, those honest conversations with these students, you know, they just kind of, you kind of see, like, at first it kind of, like, burst their bubble a little bit. But, you know, just, like, look, man, I'm, I'm just trying to be 100% honest with you. That's not to say that you can't do it. However, you need to work a little bit harder in order for you to reach this goal that, that, that you want to get to. Nothing is going to be given to you. Um, it's, it's not going to come it's not going to come easy. But also just understanding that anything that you want to have is, is going to be worth you working for. So see, see, see the big goal, but also understand that it's going to take you, you know, worry about today, you know, then when you wake up tomorrow morning, worry about those assignments for tomorrow, but just taking everything like one step at a time. So that, that's how I approach that in, um, in dealing with students and how to choose their majors, but just making sure that, that we're having like realistic goals that they can um, see. And even if it's like small term goals to actually get to that larger goal, um, I think that's important too. I agree. Sometimes honesty is, can be a little um, tough when it comes to advising these students and, and making sure that they um, understand that doctors don't just become doctors. And yes, it can be pretty messy as a job itself. Um, it's not just about the money that they make. It's also about the day-to-day -day and they have to do well in biology. They have to do well in chemistry. Um, every doctor I know has definitely, um, if you ask them if they would love to go back to med school, you couldn't pay them to go back to med school. So letting them know kind of the journey that gets there. Again, this, this path keeps popping back up and, and, and helping students understand the path um, that is, is necessary to get to where they want to go, um, but empowering them at the same time. It's kind of a fine line when it comes to making sure that they're prepared, but also being realistic about what that path is going to look like. Um, I'd love to share a time where I've made a mistake in this area and a student has kind of proven me wrong uh, because we all make mistakes. And we all have gotten to, we have all kind of had to learn from some of the conversations that we've had with students. Um, and sometimes our assumptions can get ahead of us when it comes to having these conversations and advising students. My background is in college admissions. As a lot of you know, I definitely am very passionate about allowing students to, to, to 
make an informed decision on what they want to do in their future. And admissions was my kind of gateway to getting here um, and, and allowing students to kind of, or helping students to choose their path. Um, but I was in a classroom in Charlotte at a high school that was very, um, was very high African-American population. And I was working for a school with a very low Af African-American population. Um, so I came in with the framework of, I'm gonna help these kids understand the college admissions process and had the assumption that a lot of these kids weren't gonna wanna come to my school because um, we just didn't have a, a population that was reflective of the population they were currently in at their high school. So um, I was helping with essays and one student um, who I just, connected with early on um, was asking for help with his essay. And I looked at him and I said, okay, well, it just depends on what school you want to go to. You know, like we're going to, we're going to tailor this to the school that you want to go to. And he looked at me and said, I want to go to your school. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Okay. Yay. I just assumed that he just wouldn't want to come. And I, I had to check myself and say, you know, I work at a school that gives students opportunities, regardless of what they look like, regardless of where they're coming from. Um, African-American students are not monolithic. I'll be the first person to tell you that. Um, and it reminded me that you have to work with the whole student and really think about what their goals are and what they want to do. And this particular student said that he wanted to get out of his community so that he could expose himself to other things so that he could come back to his community and make it better, which to an educator, like what, <laughs> what more could you ask for? Um, so not only did we work on his essay, um, I ended up leaving that school um, and, and coming over to CFNC, which I, I'm so excited um, that I'm able to still keep in touch with a lot of my people at that former institution. But that being said, um, that student is now student body president. <laughs> and I would have never have guessed that that student would even uh, choose our school as an option. But I really had to check myself and really think about the fact that um, my assumptions got in the way of him um, really having a fruitful conversation about his opportunities that he could have at my school. I wasted a lot of time with my own assumptions, if that makes any sense. So making sure that um, we come in and make sure that we're not already having preconceived notions about what students want and what students need um, and allowing them to lead the conversation. I think Nzinga brought up a fantastic point. Listening to students is paramount and they will lead you to where you can to where you can give them advice if you just take the time to listen so um, that's just an example of a time that I've made a mistake um, and made some assumptions about what students may want or need without taking the time to truly listen first so that being said um, I would love for everyone who is on the call today, if you have any questions for the panel, we want to keep this discussion going. So if you have anything that you um, want us to talk about or really kind of flesh out, feel free um, to put your questions in the, the chat. You see the time has come um, for you all to be able to contribute to this conversation. Um, I am going to look and see. I don't see Anything. So, um, <clears throat> Brittany, I would also invite folks that if they would rather just speak, if they could use like the reactions button and raise their hand, um, something like that, we can uh, just call on them if they want to mute this. Because sometimes people just rather <laughs> talk than actually type it all out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'll pause for a second and just see if we have anybody that's that wants to ask or contribute to the conversation. And if not, I, I will keep moving with the questions that I have. I love seeing so many people on this call. It just shows that everybody really cares about students and everybody is invested in, 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 in their success and, and wants to learn more. So this is fantastic. All right. So Brittany, if, if, if I can just uh, share something um, that I've been doing with students and I share this with people all the time. Yes. Uh, it's a quick activity. It takes like all of like five minutes, but it like really like just starts a, a great conversation with students. Um, and I was thinking about as you were, um, uh, I think uh, Ms. Williams, soon to be Dr. Williams, I'm putting that in the atmosphere, okay, so uh, is um, uh, what she was talking about as far as like different majors and stuff, so what I usually do, let me, I think I have to unmute my camera, I think I have to, give me one second, and then I'll show you what I do, uh, no, there we go, okay, so hopefully you can see this, what I do is take a piece of paper, um, any piece of paper, uh, have them draw that on there, so it's usually a line going down with a line going halfway across, what I usually do is on the left side, put whatever dream job they're thinking about. 
So you write whatever dream job. So they want to be a, a doctor, you know, police, um, you know, a firefighter, whatever it is, you just put that there. And then on the top, you have them write the uh, two to three skills that are needed to do that job that they think is are needed to do that job. And then you have them write two to three emotions or feelings that they would have, um, you know, for doing that job. And so then what happens is, so the two to three skills go on the top of the line, the bottom of the line has the two to three emotions or feelings that that job would experience. Once they get that down, you have them fold the paper where the line, the vertical line is. And what you explain to them is that this is what you want to do. This doesn't matter. This is what you want because this is the skills you think you need. And this is what you want to experience. That's more important than the title. So if you can figure out other jobs that do this, this is going to definitely help you figure out what you want to do in life. And so even if you start Googling like skills that this is required, then, you know, so if I do want to be a doctor because I like helping people, whatever like that, then look up jobs that help people. And then that's going to help you figure out what you want to do. And that um, usually frees people from just zeroing in on one thing and having that tunnel vision of like this is what I'm supposed to do because that's all they all they know right we only know what we know and so this really helps people figure some things out so again it's a quick activity usually takes about five minutes but it allows people to walk away with like oh okay yeah like maybe I need to try that I love that I'm going to definitely um I'm not even going to say steal it because I feel like we're in a collaboration yeah, it's, it's borrowing it's borrowing yeah, so- I got it from somebody too so it's borrowing <laughs> I will definitely give you credit for sure that is fantastic yeah. Um, I think it goes back to letting students know that there's so many other opportunities within the field that they want to work in. I think we all know that students say, oh yeah, I want to be a doctor. But like you said, like there, you could be an EMT. Nursing is in huge demand right now in the state of North Carolina. There's just so many things that are out there for these students. Um, And our job is to help them hone down that list. And that's a fantastic um, activity to do to help them kind of hone down that list. So they are not just looking at the the profession and the money that comes with it, but also the emotions and what your day-to-day is gonna look like. I think right. we all can attest to um, job satisfaction and how it, it really impacts your life, your day-to-day life. So that's fantastic, thank you. Yeah, no problem. And I think, and it, even to go back, somebody just put like using the interest and career survey like in CFNC, please God, I, every student I ever talk to, I try to recommend those things to like, they're short. They give you some idea of what you want to do, because I think it's also important to know what you want to do, but it's also important to know what you don't want to do. Um, and then that way you can start the uh, process of elimination. And even to go back to what Ontario shared, um, you know, about the nursing and things like that, because for me, I wanted to be a nurse at one point And because I was like fascinated with like anatomy and physiology, took two uh, courses of it in high school. I was fortunate to have a high school that offered that and I loved it, right? So I was like, I definitely need to go into the medical field. Um, I took a year off after high school and I actually went and worked in a hospital as like a surgical aid where I had to like transport people to surgery and do things like lab runs and stuff. And I thought that was what I wanted to do because I loved anatomy and physiology. The problem though is after smelling infections, I knew I couldn't do that, okay? So it was like, I was fine seeing all the blood. I was fine seeing all the bones, everything hanging out that none of that stuff bothered me, like seeing all that stuff, but seeing like, I mean, like smelling infections and smelling, uh, because one of the things they did at the hospital I worked there was like uh, liposuction and cosmetic surgery and smelling that kind of stuff that got to me. And I was like, oh, I can't do this. You know, so it was like, what what else is in my skill set? Right. So the one thing I figured out was like, I do enjoy talking to the patient. So maybe I need to do something where I'm talking to people. Right. So it's just that's what happened for me. So uh, I think that's so important and definitely, you know, whenever we can. I love what uh, Neil Van Dyke was saying as far as like getting students early out there, you know, to try to make those connections because two things happen, right? One, you start to see things that maybe you didn't know about. But the other thing is those relationships that I think are so, so, so important. And y'all said it a bunch of times, but I'm gonna reiterate it again. You know, it's it's a lot of things with students. It's a lot easier to get things done with people you trust versus the ones you don't. And if I'm only showing up at the ninth hour saying like, hey, I'm gonna help you with this and that's it. It's like, eh, you know, like, are you really there for me? Whereas if I've had that relationship with you or your organization, then, you know, if you've seen it earlier enough, it's like, it's the whole law of exposure where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, this is what, you know, I can at least trust you to know that you're going to steer me in the right direction. And so go from there. So that's all I wanted to share. No, thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm so glad, again, discussion to me is the way to go when it comes to talking about these things, because we all have something to share um, and we've all found successes in different areas. So I really appreciate you sharing, Harrow. 
Um, I, back to the CFNC thing, thank you for plugging my organization. Um, we are a state supported nonprofit that helps students, families, and adult learners plan, apply, pay, and save for college. Um, and it is a great resource for students of all ages. Um, and one of my favorite things that we have on our site, it's called the Reality Check Program. If you have not used the Reality Check program, whether it's as an adult um, or with students, I highly recommend um, that you take some time to either do it for yourself or with your students. I'm going to put a link in the chat um, for you all, but it is, we are directly tied with nccareers.org, um, and this is something I like to do with students to especially younger students, my seventh, eighth and ninth graders, to start getting them to realize that your job is gonna not only be something that you spend the most of your life doing when it comes to who you spend the most time with, but also how much life costs. And so you're gonna wanna find a job that's gonna support the lifestyle that you wanna live. So this fantastic resource is tied with NC Careers and the Department of Commerce. It asks students where they'd like to live in the state of North Carolina. And we all have students who are gonna say, well, I'm gonna get up out of North Carolina. I'm not gonna live here for the rest of my life. So we talk about comparable areas. Um, so if a student wants to live in North Car or in New York, um, specifically New York City, I like to say, you know what? Charlotte is third in banking in the entire nation. New York City is number one. So it's gonna be a comparable city for you when it comes to um, different things. So pick Mecklenburg County. Um, but that being said, they will answer questions about where they wanna live when they are adults and what kind of lifestyle they want to live. Do you wanna buy a house? Do you wanna rent a house? Do you, want, do you think you're gonna have student loan debt? Do you think you need cables that or, or satellite TV or are you good with just streaming? Stuff like that. And at the end, it gives them a budget of how much that lifestyle is actually going to cost them in their respective counties and what careers in that specific area are going to support that lifestyle. It also gives them information about what education you'll need for that specific career, different colleges that actually have those careers or those, those majors, what the day-to-day -day looks like on that job, all of that so they can make an informed decision about the path that they wanna take. And it's okay to do this process with them more than once because we all know um, that our plans change, especially throughout high school. When I started high school, I just, or when I graduated high school, I knew I was gonna work at the Gap for the rest of my life and just fold khakis forever and ever and work at the mall, um, but life changes. So it's definitely important to give students opportunities to see what's out there. And the reality check is a great way to do it. Um, switching gears, I definitely think this is a really great, great question. It comes from a dear friend of mine. Um, he asked about our websites, and I think this is a great, I got to scroll to it, sorry. I am struggling on the chat right now. Let me expand it a little bit. Luke Sweeney asked, what sort of barriers are you seeing or experiencing in navigating college websites in order to apply? and find information. I think this is a fantastic question and I, anybody is welcome to answer on the panel today, but I think my people who work more with high school students may have a, some insight on this. Um, I'll chime in real quick. Um, I, it is a challenge for students to get past and navigate our websites. I mean, even our community college websites sometimes are difficult for students to really how we label things, the language that we use on our websites is very academic. And so when you are working with a high school student, um, you know, I think sometimes we can make it more layman's terms on so that students know exactly where they can click and well, how we label a, a form that they need, you know, you know, what is FAFSA? Like those things tend to, to block students on just what we label something. And I think even starting some, I think that's low hanging fruit a lot of times on those websites, if we can make it to where they can understand what we're asking them to give us. Um, and then also just regular, you know, language barriers as far as the different languages our students speak and all those things. If your site doesn't translate that easily, I've seen some sites where they can uh, click a drop down button and change the language on that site. I think that's very helpful for students who don't always, their, their primary language is not English. Um, and I know sometimes, especially with our African-American students, I know Brittany mentioned, we're not monolithic. And so we do have, you know, students who identify in the African-American culture that speak Spanish, you know, they speak French, they speak all these other languages, and those are their first languages. Um, and so I think having that option for students to translate our websites would help them. 
I agree. Our state is not monolithic. And I, I got to be all coming right to you. Um, we have a growing Latinx population in the state of North Carolina. And I really challenged each and every one of you to find ways to ensure that you have something in Spanish in your office to show those students that you're invested in communicating with them and their families um, because they're a huge population in the state of North Carolina that I don't believe gets the resources that they are um, not only deserve but are entitled to um, as tax paying citizens at this point. So I just I, I just want to plug that that language barriers are huge. Thank you so much for bringing that up and Zika. Um, yeah, what's up? Uh, well, what I was going to add to that, she she's spot on. I mean, she hit the nail on the head um, with that information. And you can see, um, I know that funds are not always readily available, but you can see organizations, they take time to put money into their website and, and looking at that um, from a user lens. Because when you go to co collegiate websites or educational institutional websites, when you have to find transfer equivalencies, and that's what you're having to look up to find things. Like I know that that is the academic term and I'm using that as an example, but I don't know any of my high school seniors who are like, yeah, let me find an equivalency. You know, so it, you know, credits earned elsewhere. A lot of, a lot of organizations have, you, have, have switched to some of that language that helps you find that information a lot easier. Um, those things are, are really, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, you, you said that earlier. And so for them, okay, how do I find the big picture? They go to the website, they get stuck in the front page and the pictures and, and those things, and they are nice, but how do we navigate to the meat of the website to get to those spaces? Um, and, and some organizations do better jobs than others. Um, I would challenge anyone to, to, who is at a, at a community college or at an, at an educational institution to find a first-generation college student. Do a trial group with a first-generation um, college student, with a minority group, with someone who is not like you, and, and push them into that website and say, okay, tell me what you see. Give me some feedback so that you can bring that back to your institution to try to make some, make some upgrades and improvements there. So, Brittany, can I add one thing to that? 100%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just to speak to what Neil just said and uh, Ms. Williams, um, soon to be Dr. Williams. Uh, so with that being said, <laughs> um, I've, I've seen, uh, there was a school that I saw one time and I, I don't know how they did this to make it accessible, but what they did was to say what, to, to speak what Neil did was like, they gave all the steps to like get enrolled, but any term that wasn't used, like potentially not used within even at a high school level, like if that's not something they normally use, like people understand counselor. And so if they said like an advisor, but you're not using counselor, what they did was if you, uh, they made that like a hyperlink and if you hovered over that word, it gave a, a better explanation of what it meant. And so it was like something like if you went and you saw like you got to make a payment at the bursar's office, it, you hover over bursar and then it showed you like what that meant. And so, again, I don't know how they made that accessible, but I saw that one time and I thought that was pretty genius to do. And so I think I think it just really goes to, you know, we, we got to learn how to speak student. Another idea to even, you know, think about is get that information like Neil was just saying, like get those folks. But you can also use it as a win win with a uh, recruitment effort. Right. So you can go to your school recruit those students, but then tell them like, hey, I need your help and, you know, making this uh, more, um, you know, translating some of this information. Tell me what you see. Give me your, your feedback. But then you're also exposing them to like opportunities like, oh, did you know that you could do this as well? And so I think if you can marry both of those, I think that's a, a great opportunity to do so. We have a group of, of mentors with our organizations. We have about 200 mentors that mentor our students. Um, there are volunteers that come in and they work with our students from seventh grade all the way through high school graduation and I do a session with them on um transcripts and, and a transcript high school transcript is is black and white information right and you're going to start looking at it but the conversation that I have with those that those people are okay this is black and white information that's just numbers on a piece of paper but we want to use this as a platform for a discussion about where you want to go and what you want to do I think the same thing applies with what you were just saying is is can we use some of these uh, improvements as areas and platforms to talk to our kids? Now we've enlightened them on, okay, hey, you didn't know what this meant. Oh, hey, I'm really interested in doing this. And it opens a whole new door, a whole new level for them as to what they want to do. It gets them in engaged and interested in the process.
I also don't know how to take my hand down. So I've got my hand raised and I'm not exactly sure how to do that. So I, I may be sitting here with my hand raised for a while. <laughs> Brittany, are you? Oh, did we lose Brittany? Uh -oh. Okay. I think we lost Brittany. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. yeah. It happens. Hopefully, she can sign back in uh, soon enough. Um, all right. So, do we have any other comments or questions that people would like to offer? Um, I'm really enjoying the discussion, but whatever, we have about another 10 to 15 minutes if y'all want to take that. If anybody wants to offer any suggestions, maybe there's something else that you do uh, that can help uh, these students. Gwen, go ahead, Gwen. Oh, I see you with your hand up. Okay, and I had made, good morning, I had made a comment over in the uh, comments where I agree wholeheartedly where a lot of times our, our community colleges just really need to remember that our students or our prospective students should not have to learn to teach, to speak our language, which was, which was exactly what you were saying, but we must learn to speak their language. And sometimes we are attempting to just change that student's culture overnight, and we shouldn't do that. Sometimes we have to meet them where they are and as we get them to move towards their goal, then continue to work on trying to change their help them change their culture because we can't change it for them. They have to be the ones that want to do it. And many times students, sure, they are given an advisor, but many times it is that person that that student reaches, that, that person that helps the student the very first time. That's who they remember, not the person who said, well, I don't know, let me get you to miss so-and-so. Let me send you across the campus and do this. No, we have to it we have to remember the hat that we wear is the hat that's necessary when that student is sitting in front of you. I am a registrar, but I advise. I get I, sometimes I will even take my registrar hat off. I advise, I register, I do look at transcripts, and sometimes I take my hat, my professional hat off altogether, and I become mommy, I become the sister. I become whatever that student need at that time. That's who I am. And I will tell them, look, I am not representing for Tech right now. I am gonna have this one-on-one -on -one conversation with you that to make sure that you're going down the road that you wanna go down and not spend two years here only to find out you thought you wanted to be a nurse, but you can't, you really can't give anybody an, a shot. Well, baby, you probably want to think twice. Not to say that you can't do it, as it's been said many times before on this, on this, in this um, Zoom, but just think about what you really want to do. So sometimes, and sharing your personal time and your personal upbringing or whatever, it makes that student sitting across from you to say, oh, well, she could do it then I probably can too, because most of them come in saying, you know, I think that's what I want to do, but I really don't know if I can do that. Um, my mom tried to go to school and she didn't make it and nobody in my family has ever gone, okay, baby, let's, 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 let's be the chain breaker. Let's do, and if you can't tell, baby is my word. I, but I get to that point where I know I can call that person baby before I start using baby. But baby just seems to soothe them and they're like, okay, I can do that. And I make sure I give them my card before they leave my office. And I say, call me if you need something, if you just need to talk, whatever you need, call me if you got questions. If I'm not the one to get you the answer, to have the answer, I promise you I'll get it for you. So I'll have it for the next student who may ask me. So you have to make that connection with the student, make them feel like they will and do belong because students is what we do at the community colleges. And that is just what we do. And if you can't tell, I love the students, then I'll, I don't know how else I can say it, but students is what we do. 
students is what we do. I didn't, when I was in school, I didn't say, I want to grow up to be a registrar because I don't know of anybody who does because, I mean, that's just not anything that you can go to school to be is a registrar. But I also learned that cross-training is, is huge. Just because I don't work in admissions doesn't mean I should know at least the basic questions for admissions so that student can do that one-stop shop. And I'm going to stop talking now because I could go on and on talking about talking about students. That's almost like in my personal life. You start talking to me about church and I go on and on. Now, I'm not going to push anything on you, but I can go on and on. So I'm going to stop now because students is what I do. Thank you, Ms. Gwynn. <laughs> Uh, sorry about are. that. Oh. Oh, oh, there you are. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm on my phone now because my internet decided it just doesn't want to play today. Um, so sorry about that. Um, feel free to continue the discussion, Hiro. Um, I just wanted y'all to know that I had some internet issues. Sorry about that. I, I was just trying to fill in. Uh, yeah, so feel free. I just opened it up like if anybody had any additional comments. I told them we had about 10 to 15 minutes left. So if they had any additional comments or suggestions, um, anything they wanted to offer, like the floor was open. So Gwen jumped on that and then shared her expertise as well. Sure, sure. Feel free to, um, to jump on in. Um, and if not, I can keep the conversation going. All right, if, um, if we don't have anybody that wants to jump in, um, I do, um, since we only have about 15 minutes left, I want to give our panelists enough time to make um, kind of like a final statement on the importance of advising not only the whole student, but helping them choose their path. Um, so I want to open it up to the panel to kind of close us out. Um, I'll finish with some final words, but if, if anybody wants to kind of get us started on how, um, what I would say, let's, let's use this. How can community colleges support African-American students um, when it comes to choosing a viable major and, and use that as your prompt for closing remarks? And I can't see y'all because I'm on my phone, um, so feel free to jump in. I, I can start it. Um, one, one of the cool. things that I, I've seen um, since I've my time here at k um, I've been fortunate enough to have many conversations with the uh, Mr. Hyrule McMeekin, he's, he's become my, my pretty much my, my adopted mentor. I don't think he realizes that yet, but I, I've taken a lot of what, what he said and um, plenty of conversations that, that we've had so far. I've taken those those things to heart, and I, I truly appreciate um, like his, his insight, you know, on this particular subject because um, we, we've had plenty of conversations on, on this. Um, being here at Cape Fear, being here in Wilmington, North Carolina, small coastal beach city, um, one of the things that I, that I realized is that Hey, fear, you know, and I'm pretty sure maybe like other community colleges as well, but I can speak to the institution where I'm at, has to do a better job of, one, you know, seeing our students when they actually get here. Not just the simple fact of, uh, you know, they, that they've been accepted and, you know, that they're paying to come here, but how, how are you making them feel welcome like once they get here? Um, the Nixon Leader Center that, that, I'm, that I'm working in and I oversee here, that's one of the main reasons why this, this place was initiated, why it was started to, Help, help our students and other minority students feel, you know, comfortable on, on campus. However, the, one of the first things that they say to me when they come in here is that no one spoke to me when I when I came in. So so one day, you know, I just I just went out to the lobby. You know, classes just started, you know, last about about two weeks ago, and <clears throat> I just watched them. I just I just watched students come come in and out. I watched them, you know, go up to admissions and ask a question. I watched them, you know, try to talk to someone at the, the Welcome Center or go to the cashier's office. And, and and it seems like, you know, they, and what they told me is pretty much like what I witnessed. They always seem like they're just being dismissed, you know, or one of the things that they that they told me and one of the things I realized over the past couple of weeks, all these students get passed on to, to, to me. It's almost like, you know, like they don't want to deal with our students. Um, I, I find that it's, it's not only a challenge, but it's also disheartening too, you know, you're, um, right out of high school, you know, you're, you're coming in and even though it's a community college, you're still trying to, to navigate a, a new space. You're still trying to figure your, your way out. 
um, figure, you know, just like your your path in in in, in life. So just recognizing um, one that they that they exist, and then two, you know, just expressing an interest in what it is that they that they may be doing or what it, or whatever question that they may have. You know, you have a question about your your financial aid. That that's no reason to dismiss a student because you know, you're you're busy for the day, which I I totally understand. You know, I'm I'm learning slowly but surely. You know, things get super busy in um in, in high ed here in community college. But just recognize, you know, who the students are, just you know, as being as being a person. I feel like you know, once someone feels feels welcome, it's it's definitely a it kind of springboard in them into, you know, how how their day may go like for the rest of the day. I, I literally just had a student in here yesterday, came in here like on ten, fussing, cussing, like mad at the world because no one is giving him an answer to his questions. Like no one is answering him, and he's and and what and what he was asking was was simple, but. It was really a thing of they didn't want to make time to deal with him. Now, granted, I did tell him like, your, first of all, your, your approach was a little a little abrupt. But a lot of times, you know, just taking the time to, to understand it. Just because someone is is upset, just because like their their voice is raised, does not mean that they're hostile. You no, know? and, and, and I think a lot of times that you know when we see these things or we know people when they see African American students and they're upset, the, the label automatically gets you know that they're being angry, they're being violent, they're being hostile. And you know, and thankfully, you know, with with my major and with my with my background and working in the field and being being an officer before, I, I'm able to identify that. And it was just kind of like talk down a situation to where like I just realized, you know, this guy he he's not a threat to anyone. He's just frustrated. He's been from five different offices. Everyone is telling him the same thing, and eventually, people say, okay, well, go down to the Nixon Center, talk to Mr. Perkins. So instead of you trying to have, you know, it's like. I, I, I don't work in a business office. I can't answer any questions about, you know, his his account. But, you know, it's like they automatically label, okay, well, you know what, here's this black kid. Go down here and talk to the black man. He he can help you, which I can. However, all I'm going to do is just call you when he gets down here so you can give me the answer that he wanted initially. And sure enough, like, that's what always happens. And, and I think, you know, just having the opportunity to, to see our students for who they are and not just for – Point of you know getting their money and getting them to actually like come here, but just recognize they look, they're students just like everyone else. Like they're here for they're here for a reason. They're here to better themselves, better their lives, and just so like that springs into you know okay, well now that you're here, what, what are your interests? You know what what can we do to get you on the pathway that's going to get you this career that you want to go into? Which we'll have these conversations about. Okay, well, okay, well what, what do you think about this major? Or what do you think about that major? And I I think you know just. It all starts with me just 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 common courtesy and just common um, decency and human interaction. I think that that's what to to me is just kind of it's like step one to reaching that goal of of choosing a major. Sorry if I was a little long winded, but that's something that I'm super passionate about. I'm pretty, Brittany. You've heard me have this conversation before, as well as Mr. McMeekin as well. So um, I I digress. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think you brought up a valid point in that when we work in a community college, a four-year institution, a high school or whatever, we are a part of a greater community. And so when student needs a student needs help in a department that's not yours, I feel like it is our job to help them make the connection between our job and the other person's job. So when I was working at admissions, I was um, at two different schools. One the financial aid office was connected to our office, so they were on the same hallway. Um, but another institution, the financial aid office was in a completely different building. And I remember the distinct difference between a student asking um, financial aid questions when we weren't in the same building, and we really would say, we'll go to financial aid. But I learned at the smaller institution when financial aid was on the same hall, it is okay to get up and walk with the student down to financial aid and introduce them to the financial aid counselor so they can understand that we all work together. We are all part of this com greater community. So um, I just wanted to make sure that, um, I, thank you, Don Terrio, for saying that. And, 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 and just know that we, we play a role in connecting the dots for students. Um, our other two speakers, Neil or Nzinga, anything, any final words you wanna say before we close out? Neil, do you want to go? Okay. I'll, I'll wait this time. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, real quick, I just wanted to um, to answer that question, I guess, from a classroom perspective. So where I sit um, at Central Piedmont is I'm in the academic affairs area at Central Piedmont. 
Um, and I think definitely in our student affairs, financial aid, all those front facing areas at the college, we definitely need that customer service, um, but also in the classroom. So I think how we can support students more or less is thinking strategically about how we hire our faculty who teach our students in the programs of study that we're trying to get them into. So um, we know for you know, a lot of these higher paying jobs like in the trade area, the skilled tra trade areas, you know, the representation matters. Women are not represented in construction. So maybe you need to have women in your construction department that are teaching women so that as if, if your recruiters are out and we're bringing in African-American females, but then they get in the classroom and nobody looks like them and they're like, you know what? Uh, yeah, I, I can't do this because I don't know where I fit. Um, and I think we can do everything we can do to create an environment of belonging, but as an African-American student, when I walk into a space, I wanna see someone who looks like me and that I can relate to. And it helps me to kind of let down my guard. So I think if we can, you know, really be intentional in our hiring, and I know it's a challenge, right? Especially in our trades and our skilled areas, um, but we need to make sure that we have faculty that represent our students so that we don't only recruit them, but we retain them and they stay in our, at our colleges um, and they graduate. And then they come back to us because they found those connections. And it, it goes beyond race, absolutely. But at the end of the day, um, when you walk into a space and there's someone there that you can relate to quick, rather quickly, um, it helps them stay there. Um, and so I really wanted to, to kind of hone in that because representation matters. And I know we've thrown out words like belonging and all those things. Um, and so that representation is part of creating that atmosphere of belonging for our students. Um, so that's the only thing I would add from that from that lens. And I think that's it's perfect to, to have. It is, it is a great um, point to bring up that representation definitely matters. Um, and I will also say that if you live in an area where demographically it is it isn't very diverse, it is okay to find other ways to connect with students. I grew up in a very suburban area, um, and I will say I come from a, a multiracial family, and I don't look like a lot of the students that I used to serve, but if I would see a student with a WWE wrestling shirt on, I would strike up a conversation about that and find a commonality, find something um, that you can connect with students on, even if you don't look like them. Um, not only does it build that trust, but it also gives them the opportunity to talk about things that they enjoy and, and, and find ways to connect with you. So, um, Representation is extremely important that our community colleges reflect the communities that they um, are, are in, um, but it's also important if you don't look like your students to find ways to take down those walls and, and give them an opportunity to understand how we all relate to each other in so many different ways. Thank you so much, Nzinga, for bringing that point up. That's super valuable. Neil, do you want to bring up our last point before we go out? Sure. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. Um, both. And Zynga and Dontaria, like you guys both hit the nail on the head. Like y'all were, I, I was, I was writing notes furiously as she asked the question and I was like, dang it, they just took that one. They just took that one. But what I, what I will say is this, um, the two, two big things I think that I, that I take away um, or that I try to try to look at in my own role. Um, I, I can't do anything about um, my, myself being a middle-aged white male. Like I, I can't do anything about that, but what I can do is think about the way that I present to the people around me. What, what, I, what kind of opportunities, how do, I, how do I greet those people? How do I meet them where they are? Um, because you are so right that representation is, is massive for our students. And if from my role, either I sit and I watch that go by and I don't do anything about it, or I seek those students out, I look to intentionally try to pull those, engage those students in because they have content. They have like, there are, there's a world of possibilities. We just have to figure out what, what fits best for you. Um, and so like from, from looking at it from the other side of the fence, from my perspective is how do I engage those students and how do I make myself um, easily accessible and, and easy to talk to when, when on the surface, I may not look that way. Um, you know, whether that's my nonverbals, whether that's my eye contact, whether that's just going out of the way to say, hey, as you pass in the hallway, or can I help you get to where you need to be? Or how's your day going? Um, how, do I, how do I check in there? Um, the other thing that I would say too, is that you are every student's first experience. Um, it doesn't matter what their question is. You may have actually answered that question 50 times that day. 
but you are that student's first experience. So how do I relate to that student? How do I answer that question? Even if it's number 50 for me, as if it were the first time answering that question and get them to that place uh, for help. Nobody wants to be in a relationship where they don't feel loved. Um, and so our community colleges need students and our students need our community colleges. How do we make each other better and how do we get to a successful place? Um, thank you guys for letting me be a part. I, I, I love to be a part of the conversation and I love to be part of the, the, the process. So thank you guys for allowing me to be a part of it. Thank you all. Thank you so much for everybody who joined us today. Thank you so much to our panel. I believe this was an extremely fruitful discussion. Um, and for me, what I got out of it um, and hearing everybody's story and hearing what we have talked about is we've all been students before and we've all needed someone to help us iron out this path, whether it's the path that we um, intend to go on or those potholes that we experience as we go through our paths. Um, but we can each as a community college employee, a college advisor, um, anyone in education can be that person for these students. And it is important to look at them as human beings because that's how we wanted to be looked at as, as students. Um, so take time to be intentional about working with these students as they iron out their path, give them a better understanding of the opportunities that are available to them and the fields that they'd like to work in and help them understand the path it's gonna take to get there. Um, I thank everyone again for being here today. Thank you, Jairo, for um, facilitating today. Um, I'll let you close this out um, and let everybody under know about the, the survey, um, but thank you all. And I hope everybody has a great day and a wonderful semester. Thank you, Brittany. And we appreciate you moderating uh, the, the panel. We appreciate all the panelists for, you know, providing your lived experiences and just all the wonderful information that was shared. Uh, thank you all for all of uh, all of you that were uh, logged in today and, you know, were able to listen. And for some of you that even went as far as participating, um, I posted in the, uh, the link to the post assessment multiple times in there. So if you can at least it's a quick assessment. It should take you less than three to five minutes unless you have a lot to say. Uh, but please go ahead and just fill that out just so we know what, you know, uh, how you feel about this and, you know, whether we need to bring people back or not and things like that. So that, those are the kind of things we want to keep track of. Um, hopefully you found this, uh, this um, conversation fruitful and we're able to take some uh, things away for you, take some nuggets that you can either, you know, start putting a practice yourself or share with your colleagues. And so we appreciate y'all for being on the call with us. Uh, feel free to definitely look back at our web page um, at NorthCarolinaSSC.org to see future trainings and see what else is available um, that may be uh, beneficial to you and your position. And so thank you all again, and we'll close out. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording. And if you have any questions, um, uh, oh, that's the one question we 